It's the fall season, and that can only mean one thing. We've put away the Halloween candy and fireworks ahead of schedule, and have already begun the de-thawing process of Michael Bublé and Mariah Carey. It also means we're fast approaching the end of 2021, and there's been no end to the quality of what's been released. So far this year in film, we've had some absolute gems released upon the world, bringing us some absolutely stunning works that engage the mind and pull at the emotions. And these guys. And with cinemas now fully opened back up, it's exciting to see what the coming months and years could bring us and where the world of movies are heading. First up, coming at us from the unending, mouse-shaped conveyor belt of movie production comes Shang-Chi, Legend of the Ten Rings. The latest comic book movie brought to us from none other than Marvel Studios. Like it would be anyone else. <clears throat> I know a lot of people are feeling superhero movie fatigue these days as it seems like Marvel has a new production releasing every few weeks, but I really enjoyed this one, at least for two thirds of it. Shang-Chi tells the story of, you guessed it, Sean Chi, hiding from his past in California before being forcibly dragged back into the underworld by his father, the long-standing background villain, the Mandarin. Wen Wu. From there, the story expands into one of mythology and discovering who you are as a person and what you're willing to let go. The film's characters and action are definitely its most striking feature, separating itself from previous Marvel action scenes of cutting before any hits land. Shang-Chi feels like watching a modern remake of an old kung fu movie with long, sweeping camera shots and fight scenes that cut very frequently to allow the audience to truly feel the impact of a punch or marvel at the stunt work performed. Simu Liu does a great job of selling Shang-Chi, a reluctant hero hiding from his underworld past and wanting to make a life for himself as far away from his father's shadow as possible, but also willing to fight for those closest to him. He's charming and amusing in his own right and definitely has an air about him that separates him nicely personality-wise from his other quippy friends in the Avengers. A lot of people had reservations about Aquafina, but I thought she was a welcome addition to the cast. Yes, she's very over the top in a few scenes, but I can't find any justification that anyone like you or me wouldn't have acted that way ourselves if the circumstances were similar. If you lived in a world where you knew that aliens, wizards, and superheroes existed, you'd react to anything of that nature coming into your life with a mix of hype and absolute terror. The film does descend into a generic big CGI fight towards the end though, and that's where I feel the film loses a lot of its focus and becomes just another generic superhero movie. The relationship between Shang-Chi and his father Wen Wu was surprising surprisingly compelling, and if they'd done away with the big CGI monster and just focused on the pair of them and their familial conflict, I feel the film's third act would be significantly improved. No Eternals, that doesn't mean you can have more than one villain. Pick one and stick with it. And then there's Finch, or as a more appropriate title, Death I Am Castaway Legend 2 Chappie Stranding featuring Dante from the Devil May Cry series. Tom Hanks' latest movie, which some say is actually the world's first strand type movie. Good old Tom plays Finch, an aging and ailing inventor who is perhaps the only person left alive on Earth after a human-made environmental catastrophe destroyed the ozone layer and left cities half buried in both heat and dust. He scavenges for canned food by day and spends his evenings building an android called Jeff. No, no, no joke here or anything. Um, I'm actually being serious, the robot's called Jeff. Jeff goofily learns how to walk, drive the RV, and tries to understand the world and what his place is in it, as his main task will be to look after Finch's other special friend, a dog called Goodyear, when Finch has passed on. The film's very simple plot-wise, and definitely takes its time to really allow the audience to get inside Finch's head and feel what it's like to maybe be the last person left alive on the planet. It's not really reinventing the atomic bomb when it comes to post-apocalyptic storylines, however. Human beings create a technology with nothing but good intentions in mind, and then something goes horribly wrong either due to malfunction or sabotage, which then leads to every person looking like Sarah Connor on Judgment Day. Tom Hanks himself does a good enough performance when the moment arises. Some of it can feel a little forced, but he's still got that charming and likeable old man vibe about him, so it's hard to fault him on anything. The studio's weird habit of changing the dog out for CGI at times is incredibly distracting to those that notice it, but it's not too overbearing, so I guess I can live with it. But overall, the robot Jeff is definitely the glue that holds this movie together. Giving him a coming-of-age story as Finch helps him find his footing in this world really helps sell this character in a way not many movies can manage. It's almost like watching your child grow up right in front of you. Except your child can literally punch through steel and sounds like it's on the verge of an asthma attack every time it talks. I learned to talk dog. 
I don't think it likes me. Despite all this, Finch is in a complete miss. The score from Gustavo Santolala is particularly rousing for those familiar with The Last of Us, while the editing helps keep a somewhat steady pace to safeguard from a full descent into tediousness. It's charming and witty when it needs to be, but it can often feel a little empty and slow at times. But it's definitely one to consider if you're putting your feet upon a night and wanting something to pull at your heartstrings a little. Now I know it's not everyone's taste, but I'm really into this vibe that Nicolas Cage has going for him these days, where every movie movie he's in just gets crazier and crazier. They might not be any good, but you have to give the man respect for trying something new each time. This time around, old Nicky Boy brings us Prisoner of the Ghostlands, an American horror western brought to us from director Sion Sono. Set in a post-apocalyptic region of Japan where the only civilization left is Samurai Town, a mismatch of pre- and post-modern-day Japan with the old American West, ruled by none other than Doug Dimmodome. Doug Dimmodome? The owner of the Dimsdale Dimmodome? That's right, Doug Dimmodome, owner of the Dimsdale Dimmodome. And the Ghostland, an irradiated hellhole full of half-crazed outcasts, psychos, and victims of radiation. So mainly just the inland inhabitants of Australia. <laughs> Nick plays our protagonist hero, as unique a name as any, who is tasked with tracking down one of the governor's mistresses after she escapes into the Ghostlands one night. Now, is this a good movie? Serious? No, it's really not. It's sort of the movie you'd expect Nicolas Cage to be in. It's not very deep, or well written, and the acting is fairly wooden, which is a shame because he absolutely killed it in Mandy and Colour Out of Space. And yet I found this movie oddly compelling to watch just because of how insane it is. The suit they fit him with when he goes out into the Ghostlands is programmed to explode if he doesn't obey them, but it specifically has two explosive plays to detonate one testicle each. For what purpose did they need this? It's never really stated. Now those with refined taste can love a weird Nicolas Cage movie. Weird can be good. Weird can be great. But even a weird film needs to be more than just that. And Prisoner of the Ghostlands feels like it's weird for the sake of being weird. It's a fever dream that makes almost no sense at any point. It's one hour and 40 minutes of you just sitting there and thinking, what the fuck is going on? A man in a top hat turning people into living mannequins. What the fuck is going on? A rat man and his crew of scavengers. What the fuck is going on? Nick examining the two bombs located at his testicles really intimately. No, please, seriously, someone explain what's going on. Nick himself describes this movie as the wildest thing he's ever made, and honestly, I can believe him. The film deserves some praise for its haunting ephemeral score, and its otherworldly visuals can be truly striking at times. Costume design, and set pieces have more effort put into them than they truly deserve, but beyond that, there's fairly little substance to enjoy. Now if someone came up to you and told you you've just been poisoned and have 24 hours left to live, what would you do with your last day? Would you choose to spend that time with your family? Learn that skill you've always wanted to learn? Or go through the five stages of grief as best you can? But what if you were then told the person that did it to you is within your grasp? Would you stop at nothing to get your own back at them? Even if that includes going up against half the criminal underworld with nothing but some duct tape and your soon to be put into motion insatiable blood filled rampage? If what I'm saying interests you in any way, you'll be shocked to learn I'm actually on about a film. Now there's a lot of underrated movies out there that really click with their own niche audience, and yet one film I'm surprised flew under everyone's radar this season was Kate. I don't think I've seen a single person talk about this film and I can't imagine why. It's like combining John Wick with LSD and throwing the whole thing into the plot of a Yakuza game. So just a Yakuza game now that I really think about it. Kate stars Mary Elizabeth Winstead as none other than our protagonist, Gertrude, an international assassin forced to go on the run due to botching her last job and letting her target escape due to a sudden onset of minor radioactive poisoning. Waking up in hospital and being told she has only 24 hours to live, Kate sets out on a one-woman rampage to track down and kill the man who poisoned her before her time runs out, no matter how many people she has to go through to get to him. It's a hard-hitting and fast-paced movie with a lot of stylish fight scenes akin to the likes of Kill Bill, a one-woman army making her way through hordes of armed goons as they pour in from all the different entrances of a building. This leads to some unintentionally funny moments too, due in part to the ridiculous nature of how many people she's taking down, but it keeps itself grounded by showing the aftermath that this has on her body. 
In between all the action, the film does take a few moments to slow down and reflect on just how fragile Kate is herself. No matter how hardened of an assassin she is, she's still human. Makeshift bandages made of her own shirt, duct tape to tie her wounds closed, and numerous moments of her almost passing out due to her condition really ground this character to the audience and give the film a sense of urgency as you want it to succeed in her mission or to take as many people with her as she can if she does end up failing. And I'm being 100% serious when I say this film feels like a Yakuza game. Seriously, slap any song into this film and it wouldn't change the tone in any way. In fact, I think it might even improve it. <laughs> Woody Harrelson brings a welcome performance as Kate's father figure, doing his best to try and reach her so that she can be looked after in her final moments, and Miku Martinu as Annie, a younger sister to one of the Yakuza members who ends up enrolled in Kate's rampage across Tokyo and ends up becoming an unlikely ally, allowing for an almost mother-daughter relationship to develop between the two. And before you come at me like, oh but Nefri, this film doesn't have depth or an emotionally charged plot, just shh. Just enjoy the thrill ride that the film provides you with. Granted, it's not The Sopranos or more recently June, but what Kate does give us is unrelenting action in a neon-dripped setting, and it delivers it in spades. It tells the story it wants to tell and ends before it gets dragged on way longer than it should, and for that I feel it deserves some credit. Finally, a piece of media that knows when its story is finished and knows how to end gracefully. Am I right, CW? And in a completely unforeseen set of events, Riot Games has partnered with Netflix to produce Arcane, an animated series set in the world of Room Terror, following the story of Jinx and Vi and the overarching story about the conflicts between Piltover and Zorn. It's no safe bet to say that this show came out with both rocket-powered arms swinging and managed to skyrocket itself straight to the number one spot on Netflix's most watched list, enticing long-time fans of the game and those with literally anything better to do alike. Say goodbye to Squid Game and hello to a fed ADC with family problems. Honestly, the level of quality and care put into this show is something to behold. Each episode is beautiful to look at, and the best part about it is you don't even need to know anything about League to truly enjoy it, which, trust me, is a good thing. I even managed to get my mum to watch the show, and she enjoyed it just as much as I did, which took me by surprise, I can tell you that much. At the time of writing this script, only the first two acts are out, with the third shortly on its way, but if the show keeps going the way it has so far, I can see this being a top contender for one of the best things for anyone who has Netflix to watch. Overall, League's developer Riot Games has had several attempts at stringing the world of Rune Terror and its characters together into a larger narrative in the past, and these attempts have often fallen flat, not for lack of trying. The game is full of charismatic characters, backstory, and history, but almost nothing beyond that tying them together. In this narrative vacuum, however, Arcane finds plenty of room to add to the world players already know and welcome new fans at the same time. And as the show doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon, if it's possible to keep its momentum going, we could possibly be seeing even more animated seasons in the future, bringing the rest of the world to life in a way never thought possible before. This first season does a fantastic job of laying the groundwork for any future stories that the team want to tell, and I'll gladly see where they want to take us. Just give me a full season of Alawi kicking Timo in the face, please, I beg you. 